we participate in what I call sacred reality, that we need to live in right relationship to reality. That's what I call my message these days, the gospel of right relationship to reality. That is the good news that's only possible when we honor what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real. And whatever else that means, it includes nature, mm -hmm. my outer nature, my inner nature, my social nature, and my interpretive nature. So nature, being in right relationship to nature means honoring that nature, not dishonoring that nature. Right. And we, we dishonor nature when we think we can continue to use the air, water, the soil as a garbage can. Yeah. Time is real. Now, I know some spiritual people think, oh, the only thing that's real is the present moment. Horseshit. <laughs> you know, the 13.8 billion years of creativity made this moment possible. And so the past is real. Yes, the only place that you can experience or think about the past is in the present moment. That's true. But that doesn't discount the reality of the past. And the future, if we act as if the future is not real, we will condemn the future. So being in right relationship that is honoring the reality of time, acknowledging that I, the only place I can be grateful to the past and the only place that I can be a blessing to the future is in the present moment. Amen. But that doesn't make it real. It's less real. So, and dishonoring time, I would say is somebody who thinks that time isn't real or more potently in this Western culture is somebody who says the past only goes back a few thousand years, you know, God just, you know, and who cares about climate change? I mean, Jesus is coming back again, right. you know, and so that's dishonoring time. And then finally dishonoring mystery. Cause again, I think time, nature, and mystery, whatever else the word reality holds, it at least means time, nature, and mystery, because those are real, whether we believe in them or not. In fact, I love this quote from Philip K. Dick. He says, reality is that which when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. So mystery is real to that degree. I mean, not just the realm that we don't know, but the entire realm that we don't even know that we don't know. So living in an honorable relationship to mystery is to recognize that we don't have all the answers, that, that there's an intelligence, there's a reality larger than us that we're an expression of, we're not separate from, but we don't have access to the wisdom of the whole and the intelligence of the whole. So there's that humility. And also recognize, and, and to dishonor mystery is to basically think that we are at the end of knowledge. We're at the end of, you know, we, we know everything or we can know everything or we can control everything. And, and that kind of hubris, uh, I love John Michael Greer's definition of hubris, is the overweening pride of the doomed. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's great stuff. Um, when you speak of humility, I mean, what that gets right down to for me is sort of, misappropriating uh, the authorship of action and the, and the ownership of who we actually are. I mean, if I think that I am just this person and that I, that I will live, you know, that I came into existence at such and such a time and that I will come, go out of existence at such and such a time I, it, and, that there, and that I am in, actually in total control of my life or I am trying to be and so on and so forth, it's... it's um, <laughs> It automatically means that I'm not going uh, that I'm going to try to insist that things happen a particular way. That I'm going to try to box uh, all sorts of understandings into my little head rather than honor the mystery, as you say. Uh, and you know, but if I kind of recognize that I am th this sort of deep, vast intelligence which is eternal, expressing itself through this particular instrument at this particular time, then I think that automatically enables me or anyone to live in, in a humble way. I completely agree. And what this reminds me of is the whole topic that a lot of people think religion is mostly about this. I don't think it is. Religion, if it's doing its job, is to help us live in right relationship to the fundamentally real, undeniably real aspects of our reality. That is the limitations of our ecological context, the the challenges of living in community, because there are challenges to living in community. I mean, all religions have promoted personal wholeness and social coherence via a variety of different ways of doing that. And so um, one of the things that a lot of people think religion is mostly about is death or the after death or, you know, after life and, you know, what happens when we die and that sort of thing. And just speaking as a religious naturalist, I mean, I, I am a bow of gratitude to whatever metaphysical or uh, theological ways that people have of thinking about death. That's fine. Um, but I visit graveyards a lot. Connie and I visit graveyards a lot. And one of the reasons we do it is because, A, it 
promotes humility. I mean, you don't have to read too many gravestones before you realize that it wasn't very long ago that a lot of women died in childbirth and a lot of children died under the age of five. And so we're fortunate in that that's not the reality for most of us today. But it also gives me a perspective that I find hugely valuable. And that is, I'll look at a gravestone and I'll read the name and the dates and if the person's there with their husband or wife or whatever. And one of the things I'll say to myself often is whatever this person may have believed about his or her soul or spirit or consciousness, whatever transcended death that may have inspired them to live a great life, no problem. That's fine. But from the perspective of every life form in the universe, this person is everlastingly dead. And pretty soon, I'm going to be just as everlastingly dead. That is, they're, they're the, this Michael Dowd in this form with this consciousness and this, these thoughts and these feelings will, from the perspective of every life form in the universe, I will no longer exist in that way. And what that does for me is, is paradoxically, it, it's just deeply inspiring. I have one life to leave a legacy. I have one life to make a difference. And I don't want to put off the things that are my legacy work, my mission, my, 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 my sense of my life purpose, like where I can make the biggest difference for the future and for the planet. I don't want to put those things off. I went through, as I, I think you may know, five years ago, I went through a very serious bout of cancer. I had a tumor the size of my fist in my spleen. And I had six rounds of chemotherapy and then had my spleen removed. And there was a period of about a month, month and a half where we were looking at the possibility that I could die in the next six months yeah. to a year. And even when that was the case, I had, I had what religious people call the peace that passes understanding. Now, I did have one afternoon, like I was diagnosed on Thursday. On Saturday afternoon, I had some serious fear. But after that, from Saturday evening on to this day, that was five years ago, I basically the two emotions that I was flooded with, one was gratitude. When I looked to the past, I had this tremendous gratitude that I had lived at that time, 51 years, that, um, that I was graced to have lived that long. My kids, my three children are doing really well. So my genetic legacy felt like it was in good hands. My mimetic legacy, my ideas were still, my book was doing well. My ideas were getting out to the world. And so I felt like this gratitude, like, oh my God, I've lived already probably longer than most of my ancestors. So I had this gratitude when I looked to the past. And then when I looked to the future, including a future that didn't include me, like if I die in the next year, I had this trust. And for me, that's what faith is. Faith for me, real faith, is trusting that whatever happens on the other side of death is just fine. And so that gratitude for the past and trust for the future uh, has allowed me for these last five years to be in this place where even though I'm cancer free and I've had three CAT scans and showed no sign of cancer, and to my knowledge, I'm 100% healthy, I don't take my life for granted anymore. I choose to cherish every season. And like we were talking about earlier in this conversation, I personify, Connie and I personify the seasons. So at the end of spring, for example, not long ago, actually, technically, we're not in summer yet until the 21st of June, but we actually, at the Feels beginning, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> at the beginning of June, we personified the spring and we said, both of us, we were out watching the sunset. Uh, we're in Northern Michigan right now. Um, and we, we watched the sunset and we said, you know, thank you, spring, for being such a an amazing season this year. If one or both of us don't experience you again, and we actually hold in our minds and our hearts the possibility that one or both of us could die before springtime comes again next year. If one or both of us doesn't experience you again, we just cherish what a gift you've been. And then we're silent. And often one or both of us will start crying. We, we just don't want to take our lives for granted. And so that, as a, as a religious naturalist, as a sacred realist, um, it seems to me, at least this is my worldview, uh, you and your viewers and listeners may be different, but I, to my mind, it seems pretty clear that where we go to when we die is the same place we came from before we were born. And whether you speak of that as coming from God and returning to God or coming from mystery and returning to mystery or coming from nothing and returning to nothing, I think all those are legitimate ways of, of thinking about it. But as I sometimes say, not just jokingly, if where I go to when I die isn't the very same place that all of the plants and animals and bacteria have gone? <laughs> I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> I don't think we humans get to go to some special place that the rest of nature doesn't get to go to. So that's just yeah. my worldview. You know, all, regarding beliefs, I personally, I regard all beliefs as like theories that are open to investigation. 
and there are means and tools for investigating them. And you know, scientists don't get all hot and bothered if some other scientist has a theory that they don't happen to ascribe to. They think, well, let's test it, you know, and let's let's all test it, and we'll see how it works out. And maybe I'll change my mind, and maybe I won't. And and uh, you know, obviously, a lot of scientists aren't quite as flexible and and uh, objective as that. As, as someone said, science progresses by a series of funerals. But um, ideally, at least, uh, you know. Well, religion doesn't even do that. By, I, because of our idolatry of the written word and idolatry of the otherworldly and idolatry of beliefs, what I call the triple idolatries, idolatry of the written word is where you think God's best guidance, that is our best map of reality, is frozen in time. Right. And idolatry of the otherworldly is where you think where ultimate value, ultimate holiness or reality exists is only outside time and nature. And idolatry of belief is when you think any one belief system is the only one right way to right relationship to reality. Those triple idolatries make it such that si that religion doesn't even proceed by funerals, whereas at least right. science does. At least science does, yeah. Um, but still, what do you think about the idea that um, anything any ca anybody cares to believe in or not is can doesn't need to be taken rigidly, but could be regarded as a potential theory. So, do well, angels yeah. exist? Does reincarnation exist? You know, and and throughout history, there have been people who have had all sorts of experiences, which they spoke about and talked about these things. Okay, well, the, there's a show on TV called The Ghost in My Child about little kids who clearly remember a past life and come out with all kinds of details that they couldn't possibly have known otherwise. And so if it's possible for some people to have these experiences, maybe it means that we have the innate capacity to have them and any and all of us could develop that capacity and thereby use our own mind and nervous system as a scientific instrument to systematically investigate whether this, that, or the other thing were in fact true. And my basic response to that is, so what? In other words, this is one of the metaphysical things that I think can be distracting. Because what we most need to focus on right now is how we get our energy, how we grow our food, how we live our lives, how do we shift this demonic economic system that is designed to reward a few at the expense of the many and designed to make almost all of us harm the future. So how so for you it's like angels terms, dancing on the head of a pin or something yeah who exactly cares? it's like right. who the fuck cares <laughs> yeah, excuse my language that's right uh, I, you know if your belief systems if your metaphysics inspires you to be of greater service to the future and to live in a more humble less carbon intensive way then then great i am a deep bow of gratitude yeah. if your belief system thinks that you can continue living high on the hog in a carbon intensive way and who cares about what things are going to be like 100 years from now then i'm going to say your beliefs are not serving you and your beliefs are likely to allow your children and grandchildren to condemn them. So I tend to focus a lot less at this time on these sorts of metaphysical questions. And Edward O. Wilson and David Sloan Wilson are two of the leading evolutionary theorists. And they actually agree on a whole lot more than either one of them agrees with Richard Dawkins, who's another uh, leading evolutionary theorist. But David Sloan Wilson has this really important distinction between practical truth and factual truth, or practical realism and factual realism. And it's really simple, that practical truth is when it's a belief or a way of thinking that if you act as if it's true, your life is served, your community is served. In other words, it promotes personal wholeness and social coherence. It's, it's practical truth. It's like, it's a way of thinking that if, you, if I act as if this is real or act as if this is true, the fruit of my life individually and socially is good fruit. Mm -hmm. Fact, it's, it's what religions traditionally have specialized in is practical truth. Factual truth is what science specializes in, but factual truth can kill us if it's not interpreted in ways that also promote personal wholeness and social coherence. And so, and from an evolutionary standpoint, David Sloan Wilson makes the point that practical truth will outcompete factual truth every day if it's a common, if, it, if they're up against each other. So that's why one of the tasks that are, I think, that, we're, that, that are important that we attend to now is how to take the factual truth that we're gaining through evidential revelation, that is what God, what reality is revealing through evidence, how do we take that factual truth and make sure that we interpret it in ways that also serve us individually, collectively, and our pro-future? Again, mm. uh, how does it serve the future? So I think that distinction between practical and factual truth is a very, very useful one. Yeah, it is. And I think there's some really exciting and, and powerful implications to what you're saying here. Um, 
it's like we have a tradition of wanting to know things as human beings and wanting to accomplish things. Like we wanted to get to the moon, right? And a lot of people argued against doing that and spending the money. This is what practical value is it? It's a bunch of rocks. But it turned out that the effort to get to the moon not only gave us Tang, but brought about all sorts of innovations and discover, you know, technological developments that and uh, helped us look about, look back and look and, at the earth, the earth as a living one creative living reality that we either need to learn to live in right relationship to or we're screwed yeah and now we've you know built this huge particle accelerator in geneva and we've discovered the higgs boson and people are saying so what you know what what's the higgs boson going to do for us <laughs> but um you know somehow the effort to know uh, ends up more often than not having all sorts of unforeseen benefits uh, and consequences. And also, of course, gives Some us the challenges. capability of, of destroying ourselves. You know, right. it, it, um, So where I'm going with this is that I, I sort of feel like it doesn't have to be an either or situation. I mean, I know there are spiritual people who just marinate in their experiences and could give a, give a damn what happens to the environment. And it's very narcissistic and self indulgent and waste of time. Uh, but I, I also, at the same time, in the same breath, I feel like somehow the um, unfolding of deep mystical experience in, and, and the, the, the commonality of that that I see blossoming all over the world as I interview people week after week, people just sometimes with no prior interest in such things are just waking up to this profound depth of experience. It has important implications for what you're so passionate about in terms of changing societal systems and changing the way we, we treat the, um, the, the ecology and all. I, I think there's a connection there that you might be glossing over. You might feel like, oh, to heck with that. It's, it's metaphysical. Well, no, no, no. I don't, I, don't, I don't discount that. I don't undervalue it. I think that we are shaped by our experiences Whatever we call spirituality, for me, spirituality are the practices and exercises, the mindset and the heart set that helps me live in right relationship to reality. And there are profound experiences that are possible for the human animal that help us feel our deep connectedness, our relatedness, our at-homeness that also inspire us to live with greater integrity, greater generosity, greater thoughtfulness, greater care, and that I am not in any way uh, underplaying that or disvaluing that. Okay. I'm just suggesting that I do know some people that are so caught up in the pursuit of those states of consciousness exactly. that, 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 that for them they downplay the fact that 50 years from now, the generations alive, the people living alive 50 years from now, and my granddaughter is four years old, so or, or almost five years old. So that puts her one year younger than I am now, 50 years from now. And what my granddaughter is going to care about and what her generation is going to care about isn't how much I meditated, not what my beliefs were. All the things that we think are important, the thing that's going to most matter to them is, do they still have soil to grow food? Yeah. Do they have a climate that is not so punishingly cruel that it's as, it's as though they were condemned? In other words, that's what I mean, is that if our spiritual practices don't serve us to be a blessing to the future, then what the hell are they about? It's I, just spiritual masturbation. I totally agree with you. And that's why I was so excited about having this cool. interview with you, because you put your money where your mouth is. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> and I, I was at that Science and Non-Duality conference a few years ago, and somebody, David Loy, Buddhist teacher you may be familiar with, got up on the mic and was asking a, a teacher who was up on the podium, you know, well, what about ecology? What about the earth and all that stuff? And, and this guy, in a very sort of detached way, answered, well, you know, it's just a speck of dust. You know, it doesn't matter in the big scheme of things. And David was like, come on, you know, and he kept, kept kind of pushing the guy. This is where I come to ecology is the new theology, that is, and that's why William R. Catton's book, Overshoot, is, in my opinion, the most important book in print, because what he talks about are some of the fundamental ecological realities. And when you understand human history from an ecological standpoint, you realize that not only have these 24 civilizations, but other less complex societies have often, uh, where they met their downfall was when they didn't honor the ecological limits of their, you know, living in a way that was within the caring capacity, to use ecological language, that every bioregion, every 
continent, every land base has a carrying capacity. That is, it can support so many of this kind of animal living in this kind of way. Mm -hmm. Now, Earth can support so many human beings, that is Homo sapiens, but now we're not even dealing just with Homo sapiens. We're dealing with what Catton calls Homo colossus. That is, each one of us is now living that is, we are using the resources and exuding waste like 20 human beings, mm. say, 500 years ago. Right. So that's Homo Colossus. And so we have overshot, this is a fact, we have overshot the carrying capacity of the planet severely. And the only, the only reason that we haven't seen a die-off, which is common to all species that are in overshoot, is that we are taking non-renewable resources from the, this, this deep, old, sequestered carbon and putting it out and sustaining us that way. But A, that's not infinite. We can't do that in, in, infinitely. And the more we do that, we're actually lessening the carrying capacity. So over the course of the next 100, 150 years, when there's a decline in population, as there absolutely has to be, we will see, hopefully, a whatever emerges on the other side, the forms of religi religiosity won't be otherworldly because those will be condemned. <laughs> People living 50 years, 80 years from now will be condemning the religions that didn't stop the kind of chaos that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So that's why we once again need to have, as we've talked about several times in this, this conversation, this humility and ecological sensitivity where we come back into... Uh, a mutually enhancing relationship with the air, the water, the soil, the life of our region. And we honor God's limits. That is, we honor nature's limits. And um, ultimately, I'm hopeful. When you, when you step back and look at things from a big history perspective, I think there will be seen this little blip of time where we, you know, thought that we could control nature. We thought that we could dominate nature. We thought that we didn't have to worry about our consequences. And we're going to experience the catastrophic results of that in the next 10 to 50, 100 years. Yeah. But there will be a restabilizing of climate. There will be a restabilizing of uh, probably at a very different level than now. And for the next let's say humans have been around 200,000 years, homo sapiens that is using symbolic language. The next 200,000 years, a thousand years from now, or even 2,000 or 5,000, whatever, it's gonna be humans once again, as we did for 99% of our history up until just 10,000 years ago, we did live in a mutually enhancing relationship or we suffered the consequences. We, you know, we lived beyond the carrying capacity of our bioregion and we, we, there was a die off. So ultimately I'm hopeful in a longer term sense, but I think we've got some purgatory. <laughs> we've got some burning off. We've got some challenges where we've been out of right relationship to reality. And, um, and it's an exciting, it's a terribly exciting and terrifying time to be alive. But I personally don't hold out hope that there's going to be some massive consciousness shift that's then going to immediately translate to systemic institutional shift that's going to spare us from dealing with the consequences of our actions for the last several hundred years. There is going to be, there are going to be consequences. We're going to have to deal with them. But hopefully people living 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 500 years from now will, um, will be uh, grateful for the fact that humanity comes back into this, this intimate, personal relationship with God, with the goddess, with reality, with yeah. nature. I actually agree with you. I do think there is a massive consciousness shift, but I also think that, you know, that might actually... Um, accelerate the collapse <laughs> of uh, you know all sorts of institutions and, and business and corporations and whatnot that have no business that have no place in a, in a sustainable world um, and or perhaps it will buffer the change you know make yeah. it make it a little bit more smooth I, I think that there's the fact that I think that there's a national uh, a big consciousness shift is kind of undeniable when you, you begin to see how just how it's proliferating. Well, certainly um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, Ken Wilber and others speak about um, uh, this, you know, we've gone from, you know, self-centeredness to group-centeredness to, you know, nation-centeredness to planetary and global. There's this consciousness that's expanding our sense of in-group. Right. I mean, we today cooperate with people that our grandparents feared and hated. So there is this sense of greater cooperation, greater compassion, greater empathy, whether that is able to be sustained on the other side when, when fossil fuels are but a distant memory and we don't have that kind of global cooperation and global transport and, you know, I don't know. 
But I do agree that there has been in these last several hundred years um, an expansion uh, and longer than that. So expansion of consciousness, expansion of how we interpret reality and experience reality that hopefully will not be lost. I mean, part of how I see my own life purpose, my own mission yeah. is to ensure that whatever forms of religiosity emerge on the other side of the coming challenges, that it will be a deep that it be deeply grounded in our best evidential understanding of reality. So evidence is modern day scripture, evidence is divine guidance, evidence is God's word, mm -hmm. not just ancient texts, but also a deeply ecological relationship to God or to theology. That's yeah. why I call, speak of theology as ecology. Well, when I say consciousness shift, I, it, the, the title of this show kind of indicates what I mean, Buddha at the gas pump, which is that there are sort of Buddhas awakening everywhere in ordinary circumstances. It's not, yes. it's no longer a kind of a rare, un yeah. unattainable thing. Yeah. And uh, such people have an impact. And I, I totally agree. I mean, I don't want you to give you the impression that I don't, that, um, you know, w the, the things that are foremost on your plate are critical and that if spirituality has any value whatsoever, it has to contribute to the solution of those types of problems. And uh, so let, let's shift it a little bit right now and talk about, I mean, you know, people like Bill McKibben, um, you know, are saying we, we can't go over 350 parts per million. And well, we already, and yeah, we're, we're already, we're already four. past four. And, uh, you know, people are saying we can't go over two degrees centigrade and, and it looks like we're going to, you know, shoot right past that. Um, and, and people like yourself are running around saying we got to change, we got to change. I mean... When you lie your head on the pillow at night, do you think, well, are we going to change or, or am I just kind of, you know, shouting well, against the wind here? And, and there seems to be this huge momentum that, you know, little guys like me aren't making a dent in. I don't feel that way at all. I, I feel like I'm making the biggest difference that I'm capable of making at this time in history, given but is my it unique enough? gifts will and it limitations. Be enough, you well, and people like you. Will it be enough to save industrial, rapacious civilization? No. no, we don't want to do that. Will it be enough to uh, to prevent us from experiencing the consequences <laughs> of where we've been radically out, out of right relationship to nature the last several hundred years? No. no. But will it be enough to help ensure that there will be uh, 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 many of us, millions of us, that do move into the future consciously with big hearts and, and, and a big sense of commitment so that there are the seeds, the seeds are planted so that a healthy human earth relationship emerges over the course of the next 50, 100, 150, 200 years. Yes, I do think I can make that difference. I do think we are. And the work you're doing, the work that so many of these colleagues, the, these 55 people that I interviewed, as part of the future is calling us to greatness. In fact, anybody watching or listening to this, just put in Google, the future is calling us to greatness. You'll get there. I interviewed 55 of the world's amazing leaders in terms of sustainability, climate change, peak oil, and a sprinkling of spiritual leaders that can help us hold this scary stuff in ways that don't just freak us out, but that inspire us to be in action. So you would say then that despite the fact that, you know, the petrochemical industry or the petroleum industry is massively wealthy and massively powerful and that so many laws and, and things seem so deeply entrenched, so many ways of doing things, that it's a David and Goliath situation maybe where uh, their, their power and their invincibility are, are a lot flimsier than, than they may appear and uh, they're going to fall. Well, they will fall, but some of them will transform. Some of them, it won't be a matter of falling so much as in the coming, literally, just years and decades, mm -hmm. there will be a massive, the, the selection pressure, okay, I'm an evolutionary, I'm an evolutionary theologian, I'm an evolutionary evangelist, and so for, for me, I'm always viewing through deep time and through our best evolutionary understanding, and the, the, the environmental conditions for the last hundred years benefited the way we've been doing things. We've been living in a wasteful way. We had abundance of energy, more energy we knew what to do with. But those conditions have now shifted. And so now we're living in a different environment. And that environment is now calling forth. So the things that will survive and thrive in the next 50 years are not the same things that survived and thrived the last 50 years, and then 50 years after that. So the environment is radically changing. And we will see our economics change. I mean, I just last week, I was with a whole group of some of the top ecological economists in the world 
down in Southern California and other people too. There's this big conference that I was just at. And um, there is some radical rethinking of how we do economics, how we do politics, how we do law, how we do medicine. I mean, law, the idea that, that all rights and privileges go to humans and to human corporations and that humans and human corporations can do anything they want to nature that's insane. We have to have, we have a currently a democracy is a conspiracy against the natural world. We have to have biocracy. That is, we have to allow the voices of the natural world and the natural systems to be reflected in our jurisprudence, in our laws and stuff like that. So we're going to be seeing over the course of the coming decades, radical shifts. Some of it will be collapse. Some of it will be endings, but some of it will be transformations and evolutions so that whatever form of law exists 50 years from now, whatever Whatever form of medicine exists 50 years from now. I mean, the first concern of medicine needs to be the health of the bioregion, the health of the earth and the land and the water and the soil, because without that, there is no, you can't, you can't have healthy humans in a sick and dying world. So all of our institutions will be shifting and there will be evolutionary drivers that will drive that. And I expect in the coming decades, I think there's, I agree with John Michael Greer that there's two major mythologies that most people are stuck in that keep them disempowered, that keep them from being in action. One is the myth of perpetual progress. We don't need to be in action because things are just going to keep better and better. The other is the myth of the apocalypse. We don't need to get engaged. We don't need to be involved because the whole thing's going to hell in a handbasket anyway. You know, the truth of the matter is we're in an evolutionary process and there will be elements of, of blessing and good and wonderful, and there will be difficult, challenging things. So I expect in the next you know decades, 20% of the worst of humanity to show up. And I expect 80% of the best of humanity to show up. And again, we see this often throughout when we understand the rise and fall of civilizations, that they all rise differently and they all fall the same. And we're now in this contracting process. Um, that's why I love Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush by John Michael Greer and Richard Heinberg's Afterburn, you know, Society After Fossil Fuels. These so this is a quote from Jim Dodge, and uh, he's, he's, who's a bioregionalist, uh, really into sustainability. And he says, you know, all the people I talk to say that we have a fighting chance to stop environmental destruction in 50 or 60 years and to turn the culture around in 800 to 1,000 years. And he says, fighting chance translates as long odds, but good company. So he says, so let's just start with the best style and spirit that we can muster, knowing that there's only a functional difference between the root and the flower. They're both a part of the same abiding faith. So dig in. You know? Wow, it's great that you have these quotes memorized like that. I guess you've said them so many times. <laughs> well, that, that particular one I actually haven't said in, gosh, probably eight years. Not bad. Um, so when you say that 20% of the worst of humanity show up and 80% of the best of humanity show up, what, what does that mean in terms of the daily news? Are you talking about things well, like we, we, ISIS we, and uh, terrorist stuff is going to be bubbling up and, and be getting more strident, but at well, the same time all kinds of great technological innovations and and democratic things and women's rights and all that stuff are going to flourish? A little bit of both. I mean, I think we're going to be seeing, again, I think that when you step into the mindset of, you know, fundamentalist ISIS, for example, you realize that what most people want is just a stable life. They want to be able to grow their food and to do their, to do their things. And the challenge is that we're living in a world, again, of an overshoot. We have overshot the carrying capacity. So there's stressors, there's antagonism, there's all kinds of stressors that we're feeling. And, you know, it's not a surprise to me that we see fundamentalist elements of Islam that are violently opposed to the influence that they see that Western culture is having on their youth. And so I'm not condoning or justifying or, you know, saying that that's good, but I am saying that it's not a surprise that we see these kinds of conflicts. And so what I'm meaning a little bit more is that when, as things in a contracting economy, in a contracting civilization, in a contracting empire, that is where 5% of the species enjoys 25% of the world's resources and energy and, and products and stuff like that, that's not no longer sustainable. So as that's all contracting, I think we're going to see people being generous and involved and committed and engaged and working with each other. And this is what I mean by the 80% the of the best of humanity. And we're also going to see self-centeredness, greed, arrogance. That's also going to be there. 
And but I don't see that in the majority. I see that as significantly in the minority because of some of the breakthroughs in consciousness, some of the breakthroughs in awareness, some of the breakthroughs in terms of our heart and our mind and how we think and feel um, that has occurred over the last century. So I, I think that that's creating a platform where it's not going to be all good. It's not going to be all bad. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, again, part of this comes out of just understanding the way past civilizations have risen and fallen. But I think we're going to see that uh, the, the difference between those and now is we also have a climate that, you know, is going to be changing things. I mean, the last 5,000 years, which is where all of these other 24 civilizations rose and fall, didn't have to deal with the kind of extreme climate that we're going to deal with in the next 50 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, because when there's like a, snow, a big snowstorm or a hurricane or something, a certain faction gets out and starts looting the stores. But, but a larger faction, and this speaks to the point you just made, you know, becomes very neighborly and compassionate and you know, does stuff to help their people that they not, otherwise would never even speak with. Exactly. And that's what I mean by the 20, 80 percent. And, you know, it may be 10 percent, 90 percent, or maybe 40 percent, 60 percent. Who knows? Yeah. But I think far more we're going to see the better side of humanity, the better side of our angels uh, emerge. And we will see a lesson, you know, less of that. But we'll also see some some real, you know, challenges and greed and the, the dark side of humanity. Yeah. I mean, sometimes when something gets when something's existence is threatened, it really starts to you know, fight much more than ever before. So it's like there's a lot of things in our world, a lot of, you know, technologies and corporations and whatnot, which, as I said earlier, I don't think really belong in the kind of sustainable, wholesome world that you're talking about. And so they're going to be, well, I think, well, well you said you said it, actually. I mean, BP could really get into solar power. You know, they, they, yeah. don't, they don't have to. And actually, that's happening. There are some companies that are fighting the installation of solar panels. And, uh, you know, see, they see it as a threat to their business model. And there are others who think, hey, this is the future. Let's get on board with this. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is where, again, humility is useful, is that in a world that is evolving through the process of emergence, it can't be predicted ahead of time. We cannot know ahead of time. And we will always be surprised by what emerges, especially in a global civilization that is this complex. So anybody who can, who thinks they can say with confidence that this, that, or the other thing is going to be the case 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 30 years from now, they don't get emergence. They but there are, the market if yeah, good. There, there are certain patterns though that we can glean. And that's why I so appreciate the historic wisdom and the ecological wisdom of somebody like a William Catton or John Michael Greer or Richard Heinberg is that they really ground everything they say about the future in that historical understanding. And so I, the, yeah, I, I see that, you know, there will be things that will surprise the hell of us, not just technologically, but socially and every other way. Um, but again, it always, it's not like I'm pro-technology or anti-technology. It's not like I'm pro-progress or anti-progress. It's like there are forms of progress that are pro-future, that is understands of progress that mean the future will there will be a healthy future healthy soil healthy land healthy forest and there are ways of thinking about progress that is only human progress but nature's getting worse so that's not progress in any definite sense there are ways of thinking about technology there are technologies that will be pro future technologies that will enrich the future that will help us live in closer intimate relationship with nature uh, so those are pro-future technologies. And then there are anti-future technologies, technologies that diminish or destroy or damage the future. Uh, I mentioned William R. Catton, but he's just recent. My other great mentor is Thomas Berry. And I studied Thomas Berry's work for years. Every time we were anywhere near where he lived um, until he died, we would go visit him. And he called himself a geologian, not a theologian, but a geologian. And he, he took the universe story, the, this, the story of everyone and everything, what's now called big history, physical evolution, biological evolution, and cultural evolution as our first and only globally produced evidence-based creation story as sort of our foundation. And he said something not long before he died. He said that our, our current predicament and our way into the future can be summarized in three short sentences. The first sentence is that in the 20th century and early 21st century, the glory of the human has become the desolation of the earth. Mm. Meaning things have gotten better and better for a lot of humans, 
but at the expense of what we depend on, what we rely on, that is nature. So the glory of the human has become the desolation of the earth. And at the expense of a lot of humans, too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The second sentence is the desolation of the earth is becoming the great shame of the human. Therefore, this is the third sentence, points our way into the future. Therefore, given that, all programs, policies, activities, and institutions must henceforth be judged primarily by the extent to which they inhibit, ignore, or foster a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship. So that basically everything we knew from now on, everything that we do and everything we create has to be judged first and foremost by whether it's pro-future or anti-future, whether it leads to our more intimate relationship with the natural world upon which we depend or a more antagonistic or control relationship to that. And I think he just nailed it with that. That's why I say now, from now on, our theologies, our philosophies, our metaphysics, our beliefs, our laws, our politics, our economics, everything that we do as humans must be judged from now on, by whether it is pro-future, whether it leads to a healthy future, two, three, four, five, six, seven generations down the road, or whether it's anti-future, whether it is harming or likely to harm future generations, two, three, four, five, six generations down the road. Sounds great, but it sounds idealistic. I mean, you say it must be judged, but it isn't being judged. So well, that's, how, that's do we get, that's, how do we get to the point where it is being judged? Well, we, we've not even been, this is where I think a religion has been asleep at the wheel. Religion has been failing in its most <laughs> fundamental task, which is helping us live in right relationship to primary reality. And part of that is because at least the religions in the West have had this otherworldly orientation. So that's why I call these triple idolatries, idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs have caused religion to be ignoring God's evidential revelation. So let me speak in religious language. We've been blind and deaf to what God's been revealing for 500 years through evidence. We've been, as Thomas Berry says, we've been spiritually autistic. We don't listen to the rivers. We don't listen to the wind. We don't listen to the climate. And, and what, it, what are those realities telling us about how we need to live our lives? We thought God spoke to us in the distant past in these old books. And we thought where God resided was not in the forest, in the soil, in the land. We thought God resided only outside nature. So we thought we could treat nature however the hell we wanted because our true home was somewhere else when we died anyway. So we've been spiritually autistic. And so we've not developed an economy that is pro-future. In fact, almost everything about our economy and our ways of doing law are anti-future. That's why the biggest task of the next coming decades is how do we shift those? How do we transform those? How do we evolve those in ways that help us become more intimate with nature? And that's where humility and that's where ecological wisdom of the kind that William Catton talks about in his book Overshoot are, and Richard Heinberg in, in, in Afterburn are absolutely essential. We have to humble ourselves and learn from God's word as revealed through evidence that our understanding of a theology is includes ecology and our understanding of God isn't just some supernatural being outside time and nature, but as a sacred proper name, a personification of reality, what's real, whether we believe it or not. And we're part of that. We're an expression of that. So what's going to get us to do that? I mean, you see, uh, chaos. Chaos. Oh, chaos. The shit's going to hit the fan and that's, what's going to catalyze it. That's so what, we're going to get one of the smacked things. and that's going to, yes. well, it's good. Yeah. People, again, when you understand the history of all complex civilizations, one of the things you realize is that when things are going well or when people can convince themselves that things are going well, there's no motivation for any major change. It's a status quo. It's only when the things become difficult, when things become challenging, that some of that denial begins to break down. And the more challenging things get, finally, there's finally a willingness to make the kinds of changes that everybody kind of knew you had to make anyway, but there was too much vested interest among powerful entities. And so I think that we can trust that there are challenging things coming down the pike and that we, while they may be challenging, while there may be suffering, there surely will be difficulty. It will also be the absolutely essential thing. I sometimes say we are, we, we cannot avoid the great reckoning. The great reckoning is where humanity has been out of right relationship to reality, whether you use divine or secular language for that. We've been out of right relationship to reality, and we're now about to experience 
really difficult, challenging consequences. But it's also the great homecoming, mm. the prodigal species coming home to reality, to God. And so there's good news and bad news. And I tend to focus on the good news because I think the bad news is actually going to catalyze uh, and force us to make the changes that we had to make anyway. And I think the whole body of life is rooting for us. I, th I see, this is again mythic, but I see the entire body of life rooting for us to make this change. Beautiful. That's so well put. And in, in the way you just put it, uh, the bad news is actually part of the good news. It's just the dark side of the good news, you know? And that's why I think we need a popular movement. I think I'm, I'm one of those people that think that we will see an activist community, a, you know, you could call it revolutionary, but mostly nonviolent, I, I expect, revolutionary movement that will make the 1960s look puny in comparison. But again, it's not a matter of making the business community wrong, because I think there's a hell of a lot of businesses and business leaders who get this. That's why... Uh, uh, Tom Friedman says, if you only read one book on climate change, make it Paul Gilding's book, The Great Disruption. Paul Gilding, uh, his book, The Great Disruption, the, the subtitle is, Why the Climate Crisis Will Bring on the End of Shopping and the Birth of a New World. Hmm. And he sees the business community being at the forefront of the transformations, and we're this close. As soon as the dam of denial breaks, which could happen this year, next year, next year, but it won't. it's not going to be much further than three years out at most. Once that dam of denial breaks, the floodwaters are unstoppable. And again, I think this emergent sense, we will see 20% of stupid, inane stuff, but we're gonna see 80% of stuff that's just gonna blow our minds. And big social changes can happen quite unexpectedly and, and abruptly. And I mean, look at the fall of the Berlin Wall, for instance, or the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, no one really saw those things coming. And boom, overnight, they came. Um, and, yeah, uh, and, it, and it doesn't always usher in everything good. There are challenges also that got ushered in. I mean, you look sure. at, you know, well, uh, the you Arab know. Spring. It, it, exactly. But, but I do think, I do think that this is an, this is an exciting time to be alive as long as we're awake, as long as we're, we, yeah. we don't just stay in denial, but we stay awake. This is why Joanna Macy is another one of my great mentors. Uh, Joanna Macy says, if we hold the pain of the world in our hearts and express it to others, we then experience our profound interconnectedness with life. And yes, our hearts break, but they break open with compassion, and that compassion can unite us. So even though I don't have a copy of it to show, I also highly recommend Joanna Macy's book, Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. She's a Buddhist, as you know. And uh, active hope, how to face the mess we're in without going crazy, is, is really allows us to stay present to the challenges, to present to the chaos, present to the difficulties, but from a place of finding out where, where our joy and the world's needs can intersect so that we can be a blessing, but in the consequence of, or in the, in the same process of us being a blessing to others, we are also blessed in that process. I just need to retire so I can start reading all these books you recommend. Ah! <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I have a new book every week because I have a new guest every week. Oh, and and then, then there's so many. I, then my eyes are bigger than my stomach. You know, there's just so many wonderful things to consume in this way. Um, okay. Now, I have two pages of notes here of questions I might ask you in, in an interview that, um, that you sent to me, actually. And I think we've probably covered most I of them. I think probably we've covered but most of them. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered, you know, without even looking at your notes? Is there anything scanning back over the course of this conversation, things that are dear to your heart, that are important, that you'd like people to hear that we didn't touch upon? Well, I, just that I would encourage everybody to do this exercise. Uh, I just alluded to it, but you know, take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, so you've got two columns. Mm -hmm. And on the one side, list all the activities, the projects, the things that you're good at, the things you love to do, the things that light you up, that give you joy, that give you a sense of energy and fulfillment and happiness. Um, things that you're good or that other people tell you that you're good at, whatever. Just list all that. And at the top of that list, you put my great joy. And then on the other side of the paper, list all the things that you're aware of in your community or in your world where you feel the world's needs. Not just where you intellectually know about it, but where do you feel it? Where do you feel upset, frustrated, fearful, and especially where do you feel compassion? Where does your heart just break over something that's happening in your community or in the world? And you list all that. So you get two lists, my great joy and the world's great needs or my community's great needs.
And then you just pay attention to your heart. You don't even have to call it prayer or meditation if you don't want to. Just call it, pay attention to this part of your body. And what you're trying to do is play mix and match. Like where are the intersections between what lights you up, what gives you joy, what gives you energy, and what the world's needs are or your community's needs or the future's needs as you feel them. And those places of intersection where your joy and the world's needs or your joy and the future's needs intersect, that's your calling. That's your mission. That's your vocation at this time in your life. Whether you can make money out of it or not is irrelevant. It, it, it's finding those places where you can be a blessing in a way that blesses you. And in addition to that, I would say just, you know, it's kind of like John Michael Greer, collapse now and avoid the rush. Like use less energy, drive less, fly less, eat lower on the food chain. Like, like, Begin to live your life or continue, like take it to the next steps where you can feel good about how you're living. And frankly, are you a vegetarian? I, I, I was a vegetarian for four years. I now eat some meat and but I always try to get it organic and not support factory farms and that sort of thing. Sure. Because, just just because I'm told by some people that um, the meat industry is, is worse for the environment even than the, the petroleum industry. The agricultural industry yeah. as a whole, the way yeah. we, but yes, the meat industry, I mean, in terms of the amount of water that's used, yes, absolutely. All that stuff. So, you know, eat a more plant-based diet, whether you become a strict vegetarian or vegan is another thing, yeah. but at least reduce that. Um, and try not to support factory farms. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but you were, you were but, on but, the But get to, know, get to know people on farms. I mean, when the Great Depression happened, there were still a lot of people that could move back to the family farm. Mm -hmm. That's not the case now. And so make sure that you are, you know, do the work of preparation so that when the, when the difficult times happen, if we go through another economic shockwave like 2008 or worse, which is very possible, um, have a sense of security that how you will eat and live is such that if you don't have much income or have no income, how are you going to, you know, what, get to know your neighbors, get to know people on farms and those build trust and community with others who share your values such that when difficult times come, you're not freaking out. You've prepared for that so that you can be a blessing to others. So you can be a blessing to those who are freaking out, who don't know what to do. So that's, yeah, that would be the last thing I would say is, is um, know that the tough times coming down the pike are not necessarily bad from God's perspective, from life's perspective, and from the body of life's perspective. They may be really, really good. And just find those places where you can be a participant in what life is doing in a pro-future way. And that's going to nourish your soul, no matter what your religion or metaphysics or philosophy. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate your enthusiasm and your energy and, you know. Thanks, Rick. Well, I appreciate the work you're doing. I mean, these conversations can be inspiring to a lot of people. So uh, just a, a deep bow of gratitude to your work. With, uh, well, thank you.